Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to Litquake, and thank you to the library. I think it's particularly apt that we're having this conversation in the library, which is one of the few remaining public spaces that remains unsegregated soci socially and economically. And I think that's very important, so thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to read a piece that I wrote last month, and I'll entitle it, for the purposes of tonight, January's People. On election day, I flew out of San Francisco to London. The last time I'd done this was on the eve of Brexit. And as with that flight, many passengers were nervously checking mobile devices before takeoff. We were informed that the pilot had decided not to announce election results, for fear of a mid-flight eruption. But for those who cared to check, there would be intermittent internet access. One passenger took this as his cue to preemptively declare a winner. And as if further proof were needed of his Trump allegiance, he proceeded to make crude passes at the flight attendant. Hours later, when he let out a celebratory yelp and pumped the air with his fists, we all knew who had won. You're in my country now, a British woman snapped at him as we landed. I don't give a fuck, he laughed. I can do what I want. When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything, I recalled. Donald Trump's lines from the infamous Access Hollywood tape. As we disembarked, I scrolled through text messages from friends expressing shock, disbelief, and two pleas. One... Sarah, please don't fly on an election day again. And the second, may God have mercy on us. I'd been worried for months that the American election would go the way that it did. And I'd written about it, <clears throat> drawing on the Nigerian expression, shine your eyes, in the hope that we might all see more clearly the inequalities and the ever-growing disconnect between established parties and the electorate. Having grown up in Nigeria and Kenya, I've witnessed how quickly democracies can unravel. I've seen the appeal of a big man promising to make a country great. And I've seen how these men stay in power by muzzling the press, intimidating the opposition, and rigging elections with or without foreign aid. But the fact that I'd foreseen America's election result didn't reduce my shock upon hearing it. Having arrived in London, I lamented the election results with friends, all the while aware, as with Brexit, that we were busy lamenting in gentrified parts of London. The fact that most of us could jet from one city to another immediately marked us as different to many who felt left behind by globalization and their governments. I would later meet two men, both part-time Uber drivers, struggling to make ends meet who believed in Trump's self-proclaimed business smarts and expected him to rule America well. But even their admiration for Trump was not without reservation. All of these things, Brexit and Trump, said one who was Nigerian, are the shakings of end times. They are the fulfillments of the Book of Revelation. May God have mercy on us, I muttered. I'd come to London en route to Abeyukuta, Nigeria, to attend the Ake Arts and Book Festival, where authors and attendees continue to speculate about the reason for Trump's win. Some of us took part in school visits, and when the headmistress of the school that I visited learned that I lived in America, she shook her head in sympathy. We'll pray for you, she said, which sounded like something Americans used to say about the rest of the world. Brexit and Trump's win had not only ushered in political reversals, but these results were reversing the way the rest of the world viewed Britain and America, with people in so-called third world countries pitying us. Nigeria had its problems, yet Nigerians were offering those of us living in America a place to stay if need be. By the end of November, my despair at the prospect of a Trump presidency had deepened. Despair at his twittering and flittering away of what remained of the world's precarious peace. 
and despair that for all his talk of making America great, and we won't even go into the again bit, social and economic divides would only deepen. An accountant friend of mine recently transferred from Harare, Zimbabwe, to St. Louis, Missouri, said, you know, from the movies, you picture an America where everyone has it easy. And then you get to the place, and you see that so many people seem to be struggling. There's no denying that America has failed many of its citizens, and that out of desperation, people look for saviors. In America, these saviors had emerged as Bernie or Trump, with parallels in other parts of the world, if not politicians, then charismatic religious leaders. And I sat next to one such leader, leader when flying out of Lagos. I watched as grown men prostrated before him, their hands clasping his shiny red shoes, calling him Daddy. One such admirer informed me that I was blessed beyond measure to be sitting next to this apostle known for his miracles and prophecies. And then, in the midst of my despair, I too was drawn to a savior figure. At the beginning of December, I met Pope Francis. I'd accompanied my husband to a meeting of business leaders in Rome, and it was in this context that we were granted an audience with the Pope. I listened to the Pope's words, to the way he was holding the CEOs accountable, and I felt relieved. He said in Italian, involve in your efforts those whom you seek to help. Give them voice. Listen to their stories. Learn from their experiences and understand their needs. See in them a brother and a sister and a son and a daughter, a mother and a father. Amid the challenges of our day, see the human face of those you earnestly seek to help. The Pope's humility and his emphasis on human dignity touched me. And yet, as I dwelt on his words, it struck me that what I heard might be similar to what others heard in the lines of Trump's victory speech. Every single American will have the opportunity to realize his or her fullest potential. The forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. As humans, we need hope. We also need leaders. In Pope Francis, I saw a man whose life reflects the ideals he espouses and whose integrity and humility are befitting of a leader. I returned to America with a little less despair and a flicker of hope, knowing that there are some world leaders who walk their talk and whose message is not driven by political expediency or a hunger for power. My flight back coincided with another election. But this time, when I landed, Austria's far-right presidential candidate had lost. And snap, 